There was a time when I worked as a Coast Guard officer in Barrow, the northernmost city of the United States, located above the Arctic Circle in northern Alaska. The city had a population of about 4,500 people living in the extreme Arctic climate where periods of polar day and polar night determined the rhythm of life. My mornings began quite early, either in the darkness of polar night or under the bright sun of polar day, depending on the season. I started each day with a cup of hot coffee, which not only warmed me up but also helped me fully wake up. Then I would change into warm gear, checking every detail of my equipment because in these conditions, every detail could be critically important. Leaving home, I always encountered the sharp cold air, reminding me of the severity and beauty of this remote corner of the world. Barrow presented a majestic sight, where endless ice met the dark waters of the Arctic Ocean and the sky was adorned with breathtaking auroras. My journey to work was short, but every morning I remained vigilant because of the possibility of encountering polar bears, which sometimes wandered into the city. Work began with a morning briefing, where we discussed tasks for the day, including patrolling the sea and coastline, training, and any emergency situations requiring our intervention. My work in the Coast Guard encompassed a wide range of activities, from conducting rescue operations to monitoring compliance with environmental regulations and safety rules on the water. Each day brought new challenges, but also new opportunities to reaffirm the importance and significance of our work in ensuring safety and maintaining order in this unique Arctic environment. One time on an early winter morning, Captain Jonathan Hale summoned me. As soon as I entered, he got straight to the point his voice tense but confident. We're facing an emergency situation, he began, his gaze fixed on me. The research station Arctic Frontier, located a hundred miles east of Barrow, sent out an SOS signal. They're not responding to calls after the signal was sent, and we have no information about what's happening there. It could be anything from a technical malfunction to a situation requiring medical evacuation. The captain stood up from his desk and approached the maps on the wall. Your task is to assemble a team and immediately head to the Arctic frontier. We need to establish communication with the base as soon as possible, assess the situation, and provide necessary assistance. I nodded, realizing the seriousness of the moment. Understood, Captain. How much time do we have? Every minute counts, he replied firmly. I want you and your team airborne within the hour. Make sure you have everything you need for the search and rescue operation and for providing first aid. I've already ordered the helicopter to be prepared and equipped with all necessary gear. And according to meteorologists, a storm is approaching. So you need to find out what's happening there and return as quickly as possible. After a brief discussion of the mission details, I left Captain Hale's office and headed to my team. Entering our quarters, I found myself in a spacious room where the severity of the Arctic climate contrasted with the warmth and coziness inside. The walls were adorned with photographs of past missions and maps of the area, and a fireplace burned in the corner, creating an additional sense of comfort. In the center stood a large table with maps and navigation equipment spread out, and around the perimeter were personal lockers with gear for each team member. My team was already gathered around the table. They were true professionals, each with their unique set of skills. Mike, our navigator, always calm and focused, studied the map of the area. Alex, our communication specialist, checked the radios and satellite equipment. Rob, the medic, meticulously arranged the first aid kit, double-checking the presence of all necessary medications. Jack, the most experienced in the team and our mechanic, inspected the technical gear. Approaching them, I quickly relayed Captain Jonathan Hale's words about the situation at the Arctic Frontier Research Station and the need for immediate expedition preparation. Without further ado, we began preparing. I ensured each of us was properly equipped for Arctic conditions, 
warm clothing, specialized suits for working in extremely cold water, communication, and navigation devices. We made sure all necessary equipment was packed, from food supplies to technical gear for rescue operations. After completing our expedition preparations, we headed to the helipad where the helicopter awaited us. It was a Sikorsky S-92, a reliable and powerful machine specially designed for tasks in the harshest conditions, including the Arctic climate. The S-92 was known for its outstanding performance in extreme weather conditions, ability to carry a large number of passengers and cargo, as well as a high level of safety. Its spacious cabin was equipped with everything we needed for our mission, including medical equipment, communication, and navigation aids. Mike, our pilot, did a final check of the helicopter's systems, ensuring everything was ready for takeoff. He professionally inspected the engines, control systems, and navigation, confirming that the S-92 was in perfect condition for the upcoming flight. One by one, we, his team, boarded the helicopter, each taking our place and securing ourselves. Alex and Daniel settled near the equipment needed for first aid and rescue operations, while Chris stationed himself at the radio, ready to establish communication with the base and coordinate our actions with Captain Hales at any moment. I sat next to Mike, ready to provide any support in helicopter operation. Once everyone was on board and ready for takeoff, Mike started the engines. Rising into the air, our helicopter effortlessly and confidently headed towards the destination. The capability of this helicopter model to cover a hundred miles there and back in the conditions of the Arctic North made it an ideal choice for our mission. The powerful engines provided stable and safe flight even in strong winds and low temperatures, while special heating systems protected us and our equipment from freezing. Below us stretched endless ice fields and snowy plains, glistening under the rare rays of the Arctic sun. The boundary between the sky and the earth seemed blurred, creating a sensation of flying in an infinite white space. The flight was surprisingly smooth, despite the strong Arctic winds that sometimes crossed our path. In the distance, the contours of mountain ranges began to emerge, their peaks covered in snow and ice, protruding from the snowy blanket, creating a majestic and simultaneously impregnable picture. Ice flows drifting in the Arctic Ocean resembled huge white ships sailing through the dark, cold waters. After an hour of flying over the frozen emptiness of the Arctic, our helicopter approached the destination. Below, amidst the boundless white landscape, the Arctic Frontier Research Base came into view. It resembled an oasis amidst the eternal ice, a small island of life in the ocean of frost and snow. The base consisted of several modular buildings, painted in bright colors to contrast with the surrounding snowy desert, which also helped to distinguish them amidst the endless white sea. Around it spread a snowy landscape, intersected only occasionally by tracks of vehicles and equipment. Approaching the base, we felt a mix of excitement and tension. No one greeted us, which seemed strange for a place that had just signaled distress. The helicopter gently touched down on a small landing pad, cleared of snow near the main buildings. Quickly assessing the situation and ensuring the safety of the landing, Mike shut down the engines and the Arctic silence engulfed us with all its weight. It was a deep, almost palpable silence, rarely disturbed here, at the edge of the world. We stepped out of the helicopter, plunging into the harsh Arctic atmosphere. The cold air hit our faces, but we were prepared for it, dressed in special protective clothing. Looking around, we saw no one. All the buildings seemed empty, despite the doors and windows being tightly shut. There were no signs of life except for the howling wind, carrying snow whirls across the snowy expanses around the base. As we approached the main building of the Arctic Frontier Base, we noticed that the door was ajar, despite the strict safety rules usually observed in such conditions. 
This already raised alarming thoughts. I cautiously pushed the door, and it silently swung open before us, inviting us inside. Hello, is anyone here? My voice echoed down the corridor, but there was only silence in response, broken only by the creak of our footsteps on the floor. Inside, chaos reigned. Papers and personal belongings were scattered everywhere, as if there had been a struggle or people were in a hurry to leave the place. The air was filled with a sense of unease, which grew with each step deeper into the base. We split up to inspect different modules. I headed to the scientific section, where tables were cluttered with equipment and notes. Computers and monitors were overturned or broken, and on one of the tables lay an overturned microscope with slides scattered around it. It resembled a scene from a horror movie where scientists encounter something unknown and dangerous. For a moment, I thought I heard a rustle behind me, but turning around, I found nothing but emptiness. Alex explored the residential module where he found overturned furniture and broken dishes. Beds were hastily made and blankets lay on the floor as if their owners had jumped up in a hurry and rushed away. The air was filled with the smell of fear and desperation. Daniel peeked into the medical block, where he found open first aid kits and scattered medical supplies. Unfinished medical records lay on one of the tables, as if the doctor had left them in a hurry. Chris, checking the communication module, found broken radios and torn cables. It was evident that someone or something had tried to hinder any possibility of communication with the outside world. Meeting in the central part of the base, we exchanged information and concluded that something terrible had happened here. The base seemed completely abandoned, and the question of where all its inhabitants had disappeared hung in the air, adding gloominess to the already unpleasant atmosphere. While we discussed our initial impressions of what we saw inside the base, Mike returned from one of the rooms, holding a laptop. You should take a look at this, he said with a serious expression. He carefully placed the laptop on the table in the center of the room, where we could all see it, and played a video found in its memory. On the video, which Mike played, a man in laboratory attire appeared, his gaze fixed directly on the camera. He began speaking in a calm but confident voice. Hello, my name is Professor Jameson. This is our first day at the Arctic Frontier Base. I would like to briefly tell you about our mission here and the team working with me. The professor continued. Our main goal is to research the Arctic regions in search of valuable minerals. We will also be conducting drilling to collect rock samples which will help us better understand the geological structure of this part of the Arctic. In addition to this, our team is studying the impact of the Arctic climate on various processes related to resource extraction. He smiled, adding, So far, everything is going well. We are actively taking measurements and preparing equipment. The team is optimistic, and we are determined to achieve significant results in our research. Professor Jameson then briefly introduced members of his team, who stood beside him and smiled at the camera. Each of us has our own specialization, but together we form a strong team ready to face any challenges that this harsh Arctic environment may present. The recording continued for several more minutes, with the professor sharing his hopes and expectations for the upcoming work emphasizing the importance of safety and mutual support in such extreme conditions. Suddenly, the image on the laptop screen changed, and now Professor Jameson looked somewhat concerned. He began to speak about how several days had passed since their arrival at the Arctic Frontier Base. Tomorrow, we are supposed to start drilling, he said, his voice sounding more tense than before. But there's something that worries me. Some members of our team have been complaining about hearing strange noises at night. They describe them as howls or moans coming from afar. The professor paused, sighed, and continued. 
it seriously disrupts normal sleep and is beginning to affect their health. People are becoming irritable. Some are showing signs of insomnia. We've tried to find the source of these sounds, but so far without success. On the video, he could be seen turning to exchange glances with other team members who nodded in agreement with his words. We don't know if these sounds are related to our activities here or if it's something natural to this area, but we must remain vigilant. The safety of the team is my top priority and I won't allow anything to threaten it. The image on the screen changed again. This time the video was from a body camera worn by one of the expedition members. As I understood, the professor was off camera. The screen showed breathtaking Arctic expanses, endless snowy fields stretching to the horizon. The team was busy setting up drilling equipment. The voice behind the camera commented, here comes the big day. We're starting the first drilling. The video continued and we saw the drill biting into the icy surface, drilling a hole. Everything was going smoothly until suddenly mysterious sounds began emanating from the drill. On the screen, everyone around started looking around, trying to understand the cause of these strange noises. The voice behind the camera expressed surprise and some concern. Suddenly, something akin to an explosion occurred. An invisible wave knocked everyone around. The person with the camera fell but quickly got up, turning to make sure the team was okay. It seemed that no one suffered serious injuries or trauma, but everyone was clearly frightened by what had happened. Then they started pulling the drill out of the newly drilled hole. The camera peeked inside the hole, but nothing was visible just deep darkness. From this darkness, a strange howl suddenly emanated, causing everyone to freeze. The faces of the people reflected confusion and fear as they exchanged glances, trying to understand what exactly was making these sounds. The atmosphere in the video was tense. All team members seemed deeply disturbed and frightened by this inexplicable phenomenon. The camera slowly moved to one of the team members who suddenly froze, pointing at something on the drill. Look, there's something here, he barely murmured. The camera zoomed in, and on the screen appeared a small, spongy lump. Curious, the man reached out and touched it. At that moment, something unbelievable happened. The lump suddenly wriggled and with incredible speed jumped onto his hand, then like a living creature crawled up his arm and jumped straight into his mouth. The man choked with horror, desperately trying to get rid of the creature, but it was futile. His desperate attempts to spit it out were unsuccessful. Panic ensued. Suddenly, his body began convulsing, and he fell to his knees. What happened next was so horrifying that to every witness of this scene, it felt as if they were in the midst of a nightmare. Under the influence of some unknown force, the man began to shed his clothes in a frenzy. His hands elongated before their eyes, and his skin started to be covered in thick fur. His head deformed, taking on the shape of a wolf's muzzle, and a row of razor-sharp teeth emerged from his mouth. He raised his head to the sky and let out a blood-curdling howl that echoed through the Arctic expanse. At first we stood in shock, not believing our eyes, and then instinctively huddled together, not knowing what to do next. Suddenly, the creature grabbed its head, emitting sounds resembling groans of pain, and moments later, like a ghost, disappeared into the cold Arctic emptiness. After the horrifying incident where something unidentified attacked one of the team members, turning him into a creature from the darkest nightmares, everyone stood there, engulfed in shock and disbelief. No one could fully understand or explain what had just happened right before their eyes. An atmosphere of tension and fear enveloped the group, causing each member to question their safety and what else this frozen desert might hold. The voice off camera, presumably belonging to Professor Jameson, 
called for everyone to immediately return to the base. His voice sounded restrained, but an underlying sense of concern was palpable. The camera showed the team, still under the impression of what they had witnessed, slowly backing away from the scene, glancing around as if expecting something to ambush them at any moment. Then the footage shifted to an image of a hand in a protective glove, delicately using tweezers to pick up a piece of spongy substance from the drill. The very thing that had caused such horrific consequences. The substance was carefully placed into a vial with special attention and caution to avoid any contact with the skin. The vial was securely sealed and labeled for further analysis. The scene changed again, and on the screen appeared Professor Jameson, sitting in some room at the Arctic Frontier base. His usual calm demeanor was replaced by evident concern. He looked directly into the camera, sighing deeply before speaking. When we returned to the base after the drilling incident, we found that our communication had been completely cut off. We can no longer call for help. His voice sounded troubled, and he periodically glanced around as if expecting something to interrupt him at any moment. Coincidentally, the man who transformed was our radio operator, the professor continued, pausing as if trying to choose the right words to describe the unbelievable transformation. We suspect that the wave, accompanied by strange sounds and the sudden explosion, may have damaged our equipment. Perhaps it had some electromagnetic origin that disabled our communication devices. The professor paused again, his gaze becoming more serious. We're trying to restore communication on our own, but honestly, we're not sure when that will be possible, he said, looking tired as if the weight of these events was heavily upon him. Everything that has happened has seriously undermined the morale of our team. We're demoralized, stunned, and isolated here, in this frozen desert, with no means of calling for help. The scene changed again, and we saw Professor Jameson sitting in the same room. Visible dark circles under his eyes and a troubled expression on his face indicated that the past few days at the Arctic Frontier base had been a real trial for him and his team. He began to speak in a quiet but tense voice. It's been eight days at the station. Yesterday something unbelievable happened. His voice trembled and he occasionally paused, sighing deeply. A blizzard started around the station we were sitting in the main hall, trying to distract ourselves, playing board games, when suddenly someone knocked on the door. The professor paused, as if he himself couldn't believe what was happening. Imagine, in the middle of the Arctic, someone is knocking on our door. We sat there, frozen in shock, not knowing what to do. Then he continued. So I got up and approached the door. We have a reinforced window in the middle of the door. So peeking through it, I saw our radio operator, Nicholas. He was standing in the middle of the blizzard wearing just pants, looking at me as if nothing had happened, asking to be let in. The professor paused for a moment as if gathering his thoughts. My colleagues came up and also saw it. We stood there not knowing what to do. Someone said we should let him in, but someone objected, saying it might not be him anymore, but some kind of monster. His voice conveyed agonizing uncertainty and fear of making a decision. We decided to vote, and the majority decided not to open the door. The professor's voice sounded even more exhausted. He kept standing outside in the blizzard. We couldn't bear it and covered the window with fabric. The scene changes again and on the screen appears Professor Jameson, sitting in a room shrouded in a gloomy atmosphere. His expression is disheartened, and he looks even more exhausted than before. The situation is getting worse, he begins, looking directly into the camera, his voice sounding tired and hopeless. Along with the strange noises outside, there's also knocking on the door. Nicholas, or whoever he is, won't leave us alone. 
He keeps banging on the door, shouting. Usually, he asks us to let him in or starts cursing. The professor pauses, as if gathering strength to continue. I've never heard such foul language. I don't know how much longer we can hold out here. Desperate fatigue is evident in the professor's eyes. We're like trapped in a tin can and subjected to mental attacks every time. The guys are starting to give up. His voice trembles with tension and fear. There were ten of us here. Now there are nine. I pray that we manage to restore communication. The professor sighs, lowering his gaze. He looks utterly shattered by the hopelessness of the situation they find themselves in. Every day here becomes more and more of a trial for all of us, he concludes, and the video slowly fades out, leaving viewers in a state of concern and sympathy for Professor Jameson and his team, who find themselves in such a desperate and hopeless situation. In the next frame of the video, Professor Jameson sits alone in a room, his face filled with deep sadness. He begins to speak softly but heavily. Today, tragedy struck. We lost Michael. He was a good guy, always did his job excellently. His voice carries restrained pain. In the past few days, he looked worse than everyone else. We found his body hanging in his room. The professor pauses, as if trying to gather himself to continue. We can't bury him properly because we can't go outside. The storm hasn't subsided yet, and that creature is still standing at the door. The professor sighs, his gaze lost in emptiness. We took his body to the cellar, dug during the construction of the station. It's freezing there, and I hope the body won't start decomposing quickly. His voice sounds weary, and he seems physically and emotionally drained from the continuous tension of the past few days. Okay, I need to go, the professor concludes, slowly rising from his chair. He looks around once more, as if to make sure that no one and nothing is eavesdropping or spying on him, and the video cuts off. In the next frame of the video, Professor Jameson sits, holding his head in his hands, the image of extreme despair and confusion. He remains silent for a long time, his gaze fixed on the floor. After a painful pause, he slowly begins to speak, his voice trembling with emotion. We found three bodies. I truly don't understand what's happening. All three bodies are torn apart, as if attacked by a predator. Confusion and fear fill his eyes. We can't figure out how it was done without anyone noticing, he continues, his voice growing increasingly desperate. The creature that was Nicholas is still outside and couldn't get inside. So it was someone among us or this creature is hiding somehow. Hopelessness resonates in his voice. I don't know what to do, the professor admits, his gaze lost and vacant. Everyone has stopped trusting each other. The atmosphere is extremely tense. His words reflect the deep crisis into which a series of horrifying events at the station has plunged his team. The scene changes again, and on the screen appears Professor Jameson, addressing the camera with a more resolute demeanor than ever before. Two more have died, he begins, his voice firm and unequivocal. In the end, there are only three of us left. The professor pauses briefly, as if gathering strength for the next statement. I found that the sponge-like sample has disappeared. Someone must have been infected. Deep concern for the situation, spiraling out of control, is evident in his voice. I've decided to take extreme measures, he continues, and his determination is palpable in every word. I sedated the remaining two and restrained them until help arrives. I have no other choice. The professor sighs, emphasizing the weight of his decision and its consequences. Communication hasn't been restored yet, but I'm trying to figure it out on my own, the professor says, and his eyes show a determination to fight to the end, despite all the difficulties. 
If I fail, consider it all lost. With these words, the video ends. We stood in front of the laptop screen, enveloped in heavy silence, as the professor's final words faded away. We were all in deep shock, trying to grasp and make sense of the information we had just seen. Exchanging stunned glances, we sought support from each other, trying to find some meaning in what we had witnessed. The atmosphere was so tense that it seemed like the air around us froze in anticipation. Discussion of what had happened had only just begun when we were interrupted by our pilot, Mike. His voice, piercing and anxious, announced that a storm was brewing outside. Our hearts sank with fear. We realized that we would have to stay in this dreadful place until the storm subsided. Lock the entrance door just in case, I told Mike, feeling the uncertainty in my own voice. After Mike left to carry out the order, I turned to the remaining members of our team with a new task, to search the base again. We needed to check every corner, especially the cellar mentioned by the professor. The words about the sponge-like sample disappearing echoed in my mind like a sentence. Someone had been infected. It changed everything. We split up to conduct the search more effectively, each step into the depths of the base feeling like a step into the unknown. With every door we opened, with every glance into the dark corners, our anxiety only grew. The realization that we might encounter something indescribable and dangerous, threatening not only our mission but our lives, hung over us like a heavy cloud. After thorough searches throughout the base, we finally discovered the cellar, which was cleverly hidden beneath the kitchen. This discovery was made entirely by accident when one of us noticed a bump on the floor, which upon closer inspection turned out to be a camouflaged door. With some difficulty, we managed to open it and descend into the darkness, where a grim sight awaited us. In the cellar lay the bodies of the deceased expedition members, neatly arranged along the walls. The freezing temperature in the cellar preserved them from decomposition, giving the place the eerie feeling of a cryo chamber. But the real shock came when we discovered two bound individuals lying in the corner. They were the same two people mentioned by the professor in his notes, bound by him in an attempt to prevent the spread of infection. They were unconscious, but still alive. Our medic quickly diagnosed severe frostbite on them, which was not surprising considering that the cellar served not only as a food storage area, but also as an improvised morgue. We immediately transferred them to the infirmary, where we provided first aid, trying to restore circulation in their frostbitten limbs and stabilize their condition. We used all available means, including warm blankets and heat packs, to gradually warm their bodies. However, despite our efforts, they remained unconscious. Soon night fell, although here, in the depths of the Arctic night, it was always dark. The darkness beyond the station's windows seemed even denser and more impenetrable, as if nature itself emphasized the isolation and hopelessness of our situation. But sometime around midnight, the silence was broken by strange sounds. They resembled whispers, moans, sometimes turning into a kind of wailing, creating the sensation that something living, invisible, and agonizing surrounded us. These sounds filled us with horror, for the story told by Professor Jameson seemed to be repeating itself. The tension in the room became almost palpable. Every rustle made us flinch, and our imagination painted the darkest pictures. We sat huddled together, trying to find some comfort in each other's company, trying to convince ourselves that it was just the play of the wind or the strange acoustic effects of the Arctic desert. But deep down, each of us understood that what was happening around us could not be logically explained. Like shrouded in the shadow of horror, we spent the entire night in tension, trying to fall asleep, but anxiety and fear kept us awake. 
Every time our eyes began to close from fatigue, a new surge of strange sounds made us tense again, and sleep became impossible. This night seemed endless, every minute stretching agonizingly long. We waited for morning as some kind of salvation, although we understood that the dawn did not necessarily bring relief. The experience described by the professor reminded us that the threat does not disappear with the arrival of daylight, and sometimes it becomes even more tangible. The next day, the storm still raged with relentless force, as if an invisible beast fiercely attacked the walls of our temporary fortress. We tried to contact the base, but our attempts were unsuccessful due to unknown interference, which turned all signals into meaningless noise. Our radio operator said that we would have to try to establish communication after the storm subsided when conditions might become more favorable for signal transmission. We continued to care for the sick who had not yet woken up. Their condition remained stable but silent, as if they were in some distant and unreachable place where we could not reach. The medic regularly checked their pulse and temperature, trying to do everything possible to sustain their lives until they finally opened their eyes and returned to us. Soon, as we sat in the hall, trying to distract ourselves from the horror looming over us, what we all expected but secretly hoped to avoid happened. Someone knocked on the doors. This knock sounded unexpectedly and at the same time relentlessly, cutting through the silence and making our hearts freeze with fear. We exchanged glances, a mixture of horror and anxiety evident in each one of us. None of us wanted to approach the door, for after all the stories of the professor and the events that had occurred, we could not be sure who or what awaited us on the other side. I stood up first. With a heavy feeling in my chest, I approached the door. There, through the frosty glass window in the door, I saw the familiar face of the professor. He looked normal, warmly dressed and standing, shivering at the door. When he saw me approaching, relief evident in his voice, he begged us to let him in, saying that he was freezing very badly. I didn't rush to open the door. My colleagues also approached to look at the professor. We quickly conferred and decided to wait and observe this person. Although we had no concrete evidence of his infection, we needed to ensure our safety before making a decision. A couple of hours passed. The professor was still standing by the door, and it was evident that he was starting to freeze even more. He pleaded with us to let him in, his words piercing us to the core. The constant wind intensified the feeling of cold, and it became apparent that he wouldn't survive outside much longer. We could no longer bear this sight. Gathering our strength and caution, we decided to open the door. The strong wind rushed inside like an unwelcome guest when we pushed the barrier aside. The professor, struggling against both the frost and the gusts of wind, slowly stepped inside. We quickly closed the door behind him, trying to isolate ourselves from the icy air outside. Everyone watched the professor attentively, trying to decipher whether it was indeed him who had returned to us, or if it was something else masquerading as a familiar figure. The tension in the air grew stronger as we tried to understand the consequences of his return. After we let him in and tried to warm him up, he looked around with hope in his voice and asked us if we were the rescuers. I replied affirmatively, to which he, tears in his eyes, threw himself at our feet thanking us for saving him and expressing relief that he could finally leave this place. We escorted him to the kitchen and prepared a hot drink to help him recover from his ordeal. Then we asked him where he had been all this time. The professor told us his story. After he had bound those two people, the storm suddenly abated, and he found that the creature standing at the door had disappeared. Seizing the moment of calm, he decided to reconnoiter, going outside. He got on a snowmobile and circled the area, trying to understand if anything else had happened during the storm. As he was about to return, 
the professor saw that the creature had already transformed into a horrifying monster and burst out from under one of the modules, chasing after him. He had no choice but to step on the gas of the snowmobile and flee from this monster. Eventually, he managed to shake off the pursuit, but it was hard to find the way back. Soon, a new storm began, and he wandered in the darkness until, fortunately, he finally found the base. Otherwise, he would have died in the icy desert. Listening to the professor's tale of the horrors that were happening here left us deeply impressed. The incredible story of survival in the Arctic desert conditions and the encounter with something unknown left us with mixed feelings. Although we pretended to believe him, some distrust and fears still lingered. Deciding to err on the side of caution, we sent the professor to rest in one of the bedrooms, locking the door from the outside. We wanted to ensure safety before allowing him to move freely around the base. It seemed like everything had quieted down, and soon night fell. However, the strange sounds, reminiscent of whispers, moans, and cries, resumed, filling the cold corridors of the base with an unsettling anxiety. These sounds haunted us creating an atmosphere of apprehension and anticipation of something unpredictable. The next day, I brought breakfast to the professor. Watching his behavior, I noticed nothing suspicious. He behaved perfectly normally, thanked us for our care, and seemed just like we knew him before all these events. After lengthy discussions and doubts, we decided to release him. We understood the risks, but also realized that we couldn't keep him locked up without substantial reasons. After that, the professor was able to move freely around the base. We still remained cautious, but his normal behavior gradually diminished our fears. The opportunity to observe him in normal circumstances allowed us to better understand his condition and ensure that there were no signs of infection or aggression. One day, during a conversation, I decided to ask the professor how he managed to restore communication and send an SOS signal, which ultimately led us to this base. To my surprise, he replied with astonishment in his voice. I didn't send any signal. His answer puzzled us all. We exchanged glances, trying to understand what had really happened. Our radio operator, thoughtfully scratching his chin, put forward a suggestion. Perhaps the equipment malfunctioned for a moment and automatically sent out a distress signal. This explanation seemed quite logical, considering that many systems at the base were configured to react in emergencies in case of critical failures or other abnormal situations. We considered this version and came to the conclusion that in the conditions of extreme cold, storms, and other factors affecting the performance of equipment, Brief power or communication restorations could indeed have occurred, sufficient to automatically send an SOS signal. While this explanation did not provide complete certainty about what was happening, it allowed us to form a working hypothesis about the reasons for our arrival. As we sat discussing the possible reasons for sending the SOS signal and our subsequent actions, a medic burst into the room with news that both patients in the infirmary had regained consciousness. We were simultaneously surprised and elated by this news and hurried to the infirmary to see them with our own eyes. In the infirmary, both patients were indeed lying on beds, slightly propped up and eating porridge. When we entered, they looked at us with surprise but then continued eating. Their serious condition was evident to the naked eye, but the fact that they could sit up and eat again inspired hope. I approached closer and asked one of them what had happened. He reluctantly began to recall, his eyes filled with fear, and he clearly did not want to revisit those events in his memory. Horrible things were happening at the station, he began but suddenly stopped and raised frightened eyes somewhere behind me. Turning around, I noticed that the professor had entered the infirmary. At that moment, the other patient raised his hand and suddenly shouted, It's him! He killed everyone! Beware! His cry cut through the air, 
filling the room with tension and fear. All eyes instantly turned to the professor, who stood at the threshold with an unreadable expression on his face. As soon as the professor glanced at us, his gaze stopped on the patients, and he cast a malevolent look at them. Then strange convulsions began, which suddenly turned into a horrifying transformation. What we had seen on the video became a reality right before our eyes. The professor was turning into a werewolf. I reacted instantly, drawing my pistol from its holster, which I always carried. Quickly removing the safety, I opened fire on this creature. The creature roared and was thrown into the corridor by the shots. Without hesitation, I continued firing. But the creature managed to complete its transformation and staggering leaped aside, heading for the exit. At that moment, Mike came out of the door, unaware of what was happening. The creature simply shoved him out of the way, slamming him against the wall. I kept shooting, but it dodged the bullets. Reaching the exit, it pulled the handle, opened the door, and disappeared into the darkness of the Arctic night. With adrenaline coursing through me, I decided to chase after the terrifying creature. Stepping outside, I surveyed the area. Despite the night, everything around was relatively bright due to the reflection of moonlight off the snow. However, visibility was greatly reduced due to the storm. I walked along the residential module, peering into drifts and trying to track the creature. The strong wind created additional noise, making it difficult for me to determine where the sounds were coming from. Suddenly, I felt something moving behind me. I turned sharply, and at that moment the creature pounced on me. Instinctively, I reacted by firing my pistol. The bullet hit the creature directly in the eye and its wounded body was thrown aside. I kept shooting and then my comrades joined my pursuit, also opening fire. We kept shooting until the creature stopped moving. After we ceased fire, the medic approached me to make sure I was okay. Shining a flashlight on the body, to our surprise and shock, we saw that it had once again assumed the appearance of a human. This discovery struck us to the core. We stood, stunned, trying to understand how this could have happened and realizing that we had encountered something far beyond our understanding. Upon returning to the base, we carefully closed the door behind us, but we couldn't sleep all night. The events of the past few days had left a deep impression of fear and concern in our hearts. However, to our relief, the next day the storm finally subsided, giving us the opportunity to go outside. But we were in for a surprise. The body we had left on the snow had disappeared. This was the final straw. We realized that we needed to leave urgently. Hastily loading the patients onto the helicopter, we finally managed to fly away from this grim place. As we flew away from the base, I cast one last glance at it. Behind us remained the cold and darkness of the Arctic night, unresolved mysteries, and the echo of horror that seemed to linger in our memories for a long time. It was June 3rd, 1915. The summer was hot. I had just arrived at the seaport in New York and was looking around. The air was filled with the smell of the sea and engine oil. The horns of ships blended with the cries of seagulls, creating a unique melody of the port city. On the pier stood a giant icebreaker, almost 500 feet long, made of sturdy steel. Its hull structure was carefully designed to overcome ice barriers. With a wide, rounded bow, it was capable of efficiently breaking through ice, thereby reducing the likelihood of getting stuck. In the middle of the ship rose a powerful steam engine chimney, emitting thick smoke. Proudly displayed on the freshly painted hull was the name Resolute. Sailors and dock workers were hoisting crates of provisions, research equipment, and heavy bags of coal onto the icebreaker, 
which would provide energy for the ship in the cold waters of the Arctic. Suddenly, barking was heard from a distance. One of the men, holding a long leash, led a group of dogs. These animals were meant to help us navigate through the icy expanses. Soon, a man approached me and introduced himself as the assistant to the captain. His name was Lieutenant Edward Smith. He took my luggage and led me aboard the ship. On the deck, amidst the bustling sailors, I met a group of people who were conversing about something. Among them, I saw a familiar face. It was the expedition leader, Mr. Edmund Hale. He was a geologist and polar explorer specializing in the study of Arctic landscapes and climate. When he saw me, he waved and beckoned me over. As I approached, he introduced me to the people standing with him. It was Captain Edward Moreau, photographer and cinematographer Michael Thompson. I also introduced myself. My name was Henry Clark, and I was to work as the doctor on the upcoming expedition. After introductions, we discussed what we would encounter on our journey and the tasks ahead of us. The goal of the expedition was to conduct comprehensive scientific research of Arctic territories, mapping uncharted lands, studying flora and fauna, collecting meteorological data, and examining the geological structure of the region. Another important task was to search for the Northwest Passage, a sea route from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific through Arctic waters, which held significant economic value. After a brief conversation, I was escorted to my spacious cabin. Settling in, I heard a signal indicating that we would soon set sail. I hurried out onto the deck where a roll call was being conducted. The ship's crew consisted of 150 people. They lined up on the deck while the captain walked among them, delivering a speech. Suddenly, a dull thud was heard and everyone turned their heads to see one of the dock workers dropping a barrel of oil, which opened and started spilling oil onto the deck. The faces of all the sailors darkened. I asked a nearby sailor what had happened, and he said that it was a bad omen, indicating that the ship would face difficulties or disasters. I didn't believe in omens, but the sailors took them seriously. Several sailors quickly rushed to the scene to help mitigate the consequences. The captain, noticing what was happening, cleared his throat and adjusted his hat before firmly and confidently stating that he relied on the strength of the ship and the bravery of his crew, believing that the upcoming voyage would proceed without incident. Nevertheless, the incident with the oil barrel left its mark on the crew's mood. They moved around the ship with clouded expressions, filled with worry and anxiety. But the time came, and the Resolute slowly departed from the dock. The port became smaller and smaller in the distance until it finally disappeared from view. Three days later, we reached our first stop, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. There we stopped for refueling and equipment checks before continuing our journey northward. The crew also used this time to conduct minor research on ocean currents and meteorological conditions in the North Atlantic. As the doctor aboard the Resolute, I took on the responsibility for the health and well-being of the crew. As we made our way through the Labrador Sea, I regularly conducted medical examinations of the crew members. To my relief, at that time, no one complained about their health condition. The next day, we set sail again, and our next stop was Nuuk, Greenland. We were supposed to reach there in five days. The vast waters of the sea, painted in deep blue, stretched out before us, like an endless path to undiscovered secrets. The horizon merged with the sky, creating an illusion of infinity while the gentle sea breeze filled the air with the salty aroma of freedom. I had plenty of free time, and besides interacting with my companions, I spent time with the dogs. They were housed in special boxes on the open deck. These shelters provided protection for the dogs from harsh weather conditions such as strong winds and frost, while also allowing them enough space for movement and rest. They were Siberian Huskies, 
and their joyful barks and excited behavior upon seeing me always lifted my spirits. I took care of them, brushing their thick fur to keep it clean and free from matting, and checking their paws for minor cuts or cracks that could cause them pain in cold conditions. Among all the dogs on the deck, one individual particularly caught my attention. It was the pack leader, who stood out from the rest with his unusual appearance and charisma. Upon closer inspection, I realized that it wasn't a husky or malamute, but a real wolf. Intrigued by this unusual sight, I turned to Will, the dog handler, for explanations. Will shared with me an incredible story. The wolf's name was Storm. It turned out that he had found him in the forest when he was still a little cub. Contrary to expectations, the cub showed no aggression and easily responded to training. Deciding to experiment, Will included the wolf in the sled dog team to see how he would perform. To his surprise, the wolf not only adapted well to his new role, but quickly took up the position of the leader, demonstrating rare leadership qualities and the ability to inspire and guide the other dogs. At first, he wouldn't let me come close, but soon he got used to me and became my favorite. So, five days flew by and we reached Greenland. Approaching the island, we were stunned by the beauty of this remote corner of the world. Nuuk welcomed us with its colorful houses scattered across rocky hills, which appeared as tiny patches of color against the backdrop of majestic snow-capped peaks towering behind the city. The port of the city was a lively place, where locals and visitors mingled, going about their daily business. Sailors unloaded goods and equipment, while Inuit people, dressed in traditional leather garments, offered their handmade crafts and smiled at us in greeting. Soon, an event occurred, which sailors spoke of as a sign of impending disasters, foretold at the beginning of our journey. One evening, when the crew of the Resolute and the explorers gathered at one of the local establishments to exchange stories with sailors from other ships and local residents, a tragedy occurred. Our most experienced navigator, Mr. Andrews, did not return to the ship after this gathering. He was last seen walking out onto the street to get some fresh air. Search efforts began immediately. Throughout the night, the team, led by the captain and local volunteers, combed the port, adjacent streets, and coastline, hoping to find Andrews, or at least some trace indicating his whereabouts. Despite all efforts, Mr. Andrews remained missing. The next day, expanding the search radius, one of the groups found him unconscious at the foot of a steep slope leading to the sea, where he apparently slipped and fell, sustaining a head injury. Emergency medical assistance was provided, and Andrews was brought back to the ship, where his condition stabilized. Fortunately, the injury turned out to be minor, and after a brief delay of one day, we continued our voyage, leaving the island. However, rumors began to spread among the crew that our expedition was supposedly cursed, causing agitation and some panic among the sailors. The potential loss of the navigator could have jeopardized the entire enterprise, creating significant difficulties for all of us. In light of these events, the captain had to intervene and take measures against those spreading alarming rumors. His decisive actions and penalties for the disturbers of peace helped restore order and discipline among the crew. After this incident, the atmosphere on board significantly improved, and everything seemed to have returned to normal. After all the trials and tribulations in Nuuk, our ship, the Resolute, finally set sail into the open sea heading north towards the snow-covered shores of the Svalbard archipelago. Navigating towards these remote and poorly explored territories required maximum concentration and skill from the entire crew. We traversed the cold and stormy waters of the Arctic Ocean, encountering large icebergs and extensive fields of drifting ice. Day after day, despite the short polar nights, we continued our journey, 
facing harsh Arctic winds and ocean currents that tested our resilience and determination. As we approached Svalbard, the marine landscape became increasingly captivating. Glittering glaciers towering majestically over the sea began to appear on the horizon. Polar bears could occasionally be spotted on ice flows, while seabirds accompanied us on our journey, creating the sensation that we were truly approaching the edge of the Earth. Arriving at the Svalbard archipelago marked the final stop of our journey, where we could conduct research on Arctic flora and fauna and study the impact of the Arctic climate on local ecosystems. It was also the last opportunity to replenish supplies before continuing our journey into the heart of the Arctic. We entered one of its protected fjords, where the water was as calm as a mirror, reflecting the majestic snow-capped peaks and impregnable glaciers. This world seemed untouched by time, presenting pristine beauty and the might of nature. Soon we arrived at the port in Long Yerbien. It was simple and functional, without modern amenities. Wooden docks for receiving small ships and boats, warehouses for coal, fish, and whale blubber, as well as several buildings for housing and equipment storage for research expeditions. The port infrastructure served the basic needs of arriving vessels and was an important supply point for anyone daring to explore or work in this harsh Arctic region. We decided to make a three-day stop here to replenish supplies and conduct necessary research. Fortunately, no unforeseen events occurred, except for one detail. At night, the dogs started howling, causing confusion for their caretaker. I noticed that the initiator of this howling was the wolf storm, followed by the other dogs. These nocturnal concerts caused alarm among the superstitious sailors on board. Such a nervous atmosphere persisted for all three days, and on the day of our departure, another event occurred, adding fuel to the fire of superstition. As soon as the ship began to depart from the pier, our eyes involuntarily fell on the priest standing on the shore. One of the sailors couldn't contain his emotions and loudly pointed him out. Instantly, whispers and mutterings spread among the crew. I learned that seeing a priest before departure is considered the worst omen among sailors. Looking back at the receding shore, it couldn't help but feel that all signs were indicating to us the need to abandon further sailing. But despite the accumulating omens, our expedition continued its journey into uncharted waters. After our departure from Svalbard, the Resolute Expedition headed towards one of the most mesmerizing and unexplored parts of our planet, the North Pole. Navigating through ice fields and open waters of the Arctic Ocean, our ship faced numerous challenges. Vast ice flows, shifting and changing shape under the influence of winds and currents, constantly forced us to adjust our course seeking safe passages through frozen expanses. Navigation in such conditions required maximum concentration and professionalism from the team. Days and nights merged into one under the white glow of the polar day, when the sun barely touched the horizon, creating an uninterrupted bright midday twilight. Polar bears, gracefully moving across the ice in search of food, seals peeking out from under the ice, and herds of walruses resting on the edge of icebergs reminded us that life stubbornly clings to existence even in the harshest conditions. Each day brought new scientific data. We studied the composition of seawater, took depth measurements, and mapped previously unknown sections of the seabed, contributing to the development of Arctic research. As soon as the Resolute ventured into the heart of the frozen waters of the Arctic, we encountered a fate about which many sailors had spun dark legends. Surrounded by endless ice, we found that our path forward was completely blocked by powerful ice fields. The ship was trapped in an ice prison, firmly gripped in the cold embrace of the Arctic. 
Time seemed to stand still, and with each passing hour, the ice tightened its steel claws around our vessel. The first order of business was a meeting of the crew to discuss the plan of action. Breaking free from the ice trap was not simple. It required concerted efforts from every member of the crew and the use of all available resources. The captain issued orders. Part of the crew had to start chopping ice around the ship, attempting to create a channel to exit into open water, while others worked on maintaining the functionality of the ship's engine and life support systems in extreme cold conditions. We used everything that could help in our struggle for freedom, from heavy ice axes and saws to explosives for controlled explosions aimed at weakening the ice encasement. While the team worked diligently to free the ship from the ice trap, Lieutenant Smith and photographer Michael Thompson decided to conduct reconnaissance of the surroundings on dog sleds. Setting off at dawn, they promised to return by lunchtime. However, time passed, and there was no news or trace of them. The expedition leader, Professor Hale, consumed by worry, paced the deck back and forth, while the captain tried to reassure him, suggesting waiting a little longer before sending a search party. Tension reached its peak, and the professor was about to organize a search party when suddenly a cry rang out in the air. One of the sailors pointed excitedly towards the horizon, where two dog sleds were slowly approaching the ship. These were our missing explorers. As they drew closer, it became evident that the trials they had faced had taken their toll. Lieutenant Smith and Michael Thompson looked exhausted to the limit, and exhaustion was evident in their eyes. The dogs, in turn, seemed frightened and could barely muster the strength to climb aboard the ship. Once they had recovered from their ordeal, they gathered the crew of the Resolute around them to share the story of their unexpected adventure. Gathered in tense silence, the explorers recounted their reconnaissance. We followed the planned route when we noticed something that seemed absurd in these endless snowy expanses, a black spot. This spot on the white background caught our attention and we decided to change course to investigate it further, began Lieutenant Smith. As they approached closer, they discovered that the mysterious black spot was actually a ship the outlines of which resembled vessels from the 19th century, stranded in the ice and surrounded by a snowy desert. Michael Thompson added, It was like a frozen-in-time vision. The ship seemed to have just stopped and was waiting to be rediscovered. But as we approached even closer, our dog suddenly panicked. The dogs, who had faithfully followed the sleds until that moment, suddenly went berserk starting to bark furiously and, despite all attempts to restrain them, tore away, dragging the sleds into the depths of the white wasteland. Attempts to calm them down were in vain. We raced through the snow, losing all control, continued the lieutenant. With difficulty, they managed to regain control over the sleds and eventually make their way back to the Resolute. Their return was filled with relief but also with new questions about what could have caused such a reaction in the dogs and what mysteries the found ship held. Lieutenant Smith's and Michael Thompson's story about the mysterious ship stuck in the ice stirred strong excitement and intrigue among everyone aboard the Resolute. The decision to organize a second expedition to the location of the frozen ship was made the next day. I eagerly volunteered to join the group of explorers. We prepared the necessary equipment, assembled the sleds, and set out in the morning armed with maps and compasses. While we headed towards the location of the ship, the remaining part of the crew continued to work on freeing the Resolute from the ice trap. The work with ice axes and saws never ceased for a moment. Navigating through snowdrifts and ice fields, we followed our sleds, which were struggling through the Arctic wilderness. As the contours of the ship began to appear on the horizon, our dogs suddenly began to show signs of distress. 
Their nervous behavior was so unusual that we decided to stop at a safe distance from the discovered vessel, leaving the dogs under the watchful eye of the handler. From that moment on, we continued on foot, feeling how each step brought us closer to something uncharted and possibly dangerous. Pushing through dense snow, we found ourselves at the foot of a giant. It was a 19th century Dutch frigate. It loomed before us like a ghost from the past, shrouded in the mystical aura of Arctic legends. The first thing that caught our eye was its mighty weathered hull, colored by time in deep dark shades, with traces of white paint here and there, reminiscent of its former grandeur and power. The ship seemed frozen in time, its wooden surfaces covered with a layer of hoarfrost, giving it a ghostly appearance. The frigate's masts were broken and lay in disarray on its deck and around on the ice, and what remained of the sails hung in tatters on the ropes, swaying rhythmically under the Arctic winds. Once snowy white, these sails were now torn and stained, as if bearing witness to countless storms endured by the ship. The ship's deck was covered with a layer of snow and ice, creating the impression that no one had set foot on it for many years. Around the deck lay scattered maritime ropes, fragments of wood, and other items once necessary for the work and life of sailors. Despite its damages, the frigate still retained the outlines of a proud vessel that carried its passengers and cargo through the raging waters of the oceans. The atmosphere was filled with heavy silence, broken only by the whisper of the wind, which seemed like a barely audible moan of lost souls. As we approached closer, we began to feel an inexplicable unease, as if invisible eyes were watching us from behind the ship's warped hulls. We circled the frigate, trying to find any way aboard or inside to explore it and learn more about its past. Each step felt heavy, and there was a palpable sense of threat in the air. Professor Hale warned us to be cautious, as a bear could be hiding, which might have caused the dog's nervousness. Boarding the ship, our gaze fell on the door leading into the depths of the ship. Attempting to open it in the usual way proved futile. The door was frozen solid to the frame. Then, taking a run-up, Michael, with a powerful shoulder blow, broke it down, disrupting the prevailing dead silence. This abrupt sound echoed through the deserted expanses of the ship, as if awakening it from a centuries-old slumber. We lit a gas lantern, and its flickering light illuminated the path downwards, into the corridor, along which doors to the cabins were located. Descending the stairs, we felt the air getting colder with each step, and each breath filled our lungs with piercing coldness. The first door we opened led to a living cabin, where a skeleton lay on the bed in eternal repose. The scene seemed both peaceful and unsettling. It seemed as if the person had fallen asleep and never woke up frozen in sleep for centuries. We continued to inspect the cabins, and in each of them we were greeted with similar scenes. Skeletons of the crew, frozen in different poses of everyday life, as if death had suddenly overtaken them. The frozen skeletons still retained black remnants of flesh, chillingly well preserved in Arctic conditions. Continuing our exploration, we noticed that the interior of the cabin seemed imbued with the spirit of the past, from the personal belongings of the sailors to maps and navigational instruments. Everything was frozen in time, creating a sense of invisible connection between us and the long-gone era. The air in the cabins was cold and still, and the flickering of our lantern cast dancing shadows on the walls prompting the imagination to paint vivid pictures of the past. Hoarfrost covered every surface, giving the rooms the appearance of frozen time capsules. Reaching the last door, we discovered the captain's cabin. In the center of the room stood a writing desk, behind which sat a skeleton in the posture of someone busy writing. 
Approaching closer, we saw that a ship's log lay before him. Michael, acting cautiously, carefully extracted it from under the bony fingers. The log was written in Dutch, and Professor Hale, who was proficient in it, began to translate. Here is what was written there. June 23rd, 1884. Today we left port to explore the northern seas. Our journey began under favorable stars, and the crew is full of determination to uncover the mysteries hidden in the icy waters. July 2nd, 1884. We have veered off course. Unforeseen Arctic storms have carried us far north into uncharted waters where sea and sky merge into one. Here, where ice rules, we find ourselves trapped, surrounded by ominous ice flows. July 15th, 1884. Our struggle with the ice continues. We attempt to break through the frozen barriers, but nature proves stronger. With each passing day, the situation becomes more desperate. July 28th, 1884. Sudden disappearances have begun. The first to vanish was a young sailor. Then a fog enveloped the area, and he returned, standing on the edge of the ice and silently watching the ship. When we tried to approach, he retreated into the fog. Through a spyglass, we saw that his eyes were lifeless. It was the most horrifying discovery. August 12th, 1884. The disappearances continue, and every night the missing return to stand on the ice and silently observe us. In these soulless eyes, there is not a hint of life. August 20th, 1884. One of our bravest sailors discovered something incredible not far from the ship a giant creature resembling a squid, frozen in the ice. We concluded that it is this creature that is behind our woes. August 27th, 1884. The decision is made. We have begun to cleave the ice to reach the creature. The work is arduous, but the determination of the crew knows no bounds. We are almost there. August 28th, 1884. Tomorrow should be the decisive day. If all goes according to plan, we will destroy the creature and put an end to this nightmare. I hope the next entry will be about our... These were the last words left by the captain in the ship's log, the words trailing off as if death had come instantly. My companions and I exchanged frightened glances trying to understand the events that had unfolded on this ship. Professor Hale, taking advantage of the moment of silence, suggested that we leave this place immediately. We all nodded in agreement, agreeing with his wise advice. However, when we found ourselves back on deck, Michael noticed a hatch that apparently led to the cargo hold. Despite our attempts to convince him not to take risks and to leave as soon as possible, he was adamant in his decision to continue searching, assuring us that he would do everything quickly and without any trouble. After a short time, his voice echoed from the depths of the ship, and we, overcoming our fear, followed the sound. In the cargo hold, an amazing sight awaited us. Michael stood next to one of the many crates scattered on the floor, and to his great joy, he discovered that it was full of gold. In the eyes of my companions, I saw the reflection of greed, while Michael did not hide his delight at such a find. We checked other crates, and each of them was also filled with gold. After a brief discussion, it was decided to transfer the gold to our ship. Although I too felt joy at such luck, deep down a sense of foreboding crept into my soul urging me to flee as quickly as possible. But, as often happens, the voice of reason and the desire to possess the treasure prevailed over instinctual feelings of danger. When we returned to the sleds, we were met with a scene that filled our hearts with cold horror. All the dogs lay dead, their bodies mutilated as if attacked by some ferocious predator. Among the lifeless bodies of our faithful companions, 
we found the body of the Watchman Will, torn apart with the same cruelty, suggesting an attack by a bear, although it was impossible to determine the exact cause of this tragedy. Amidst the chaos and destruction, I noticed the absence of Storm, the wolf. He was not among the dead. This circumstance remained a mystery, intensifying the atmosphere of anxiety and incomprehension. We were deeply saddened by the loss. With heavy hearts, we carried Will's body aboard the ship, where we buried him with honors. This event shrouded the expedition in a veil of sorrow and mourning. Following this tragedy, panic and superstition began to spread among the sailors. Whispers of an unholy force roaming the ice, of ancient Arctic guardians rising against intruders, filled the ship. Many began to see this ominous sign as a warning and a call to retreat, while others sought logical explanations for what had happened. At that time, sleep came to me with difficulty, and my soul was filled with worry and sadness over the loss of Will, with whom I was particularly close. His sudden death left a deep wound in my heart. Thoughts of what had happened filled every minute until suddenly I was awakened by a piercing scream. Rushing onto the deck, I was met with chaos. One of the sentries had disappeared without a trace. His partner, the only witness, shared with us the gruesome details. According to him, when everyone was already asleep, a fog thickened around the ship. However, this fog behaved strangely as if deliberately avoiding approaching the ship, forming a kind of safe zone around it. During his watch, when the witness momentarily left, his partner disappeared. His return brought no signs of his presence. Despite a thorough search of the entire ship, the missing man was never found, which raised alarm. Listening to this account, those of us who had been on the doomed ship with horror realized that what was happening ominously echoed the descriptions from the ship's log. The same inexplicable phenomena, the same mystical fog, and mysterious disappearances. All of it indicated that we might have encountered the same unexplained threat that had destroyed the crew of the ship we found years ago. Despite the grim events, we found ourselves unable to leave the icy clutches into which fate had bound us. The captain, realizing the seriousness of the situation, ordered the work to free the ship to be accelerated. In addition, he formed a squad of ten soldiers and decided to return to the ill-fated ship. The gold was too valuable a trophy to leave behind. Understanding that the risk of injury was high, I decided to join them as a medic. When we reached the ship, the weather was getting worse. The wind was picking up. Climbing onto its deck, I surveyed the surroundings. Besides the rustling of torn scraps of sails flapping in the wind, there was dead silence all around. We descended into the hold and began extracting the gold. Suddenly, my hearing caught a strange noise from a dark corner where something was lurking behind old barrels. One of the sailors noticed it and went to investigate the source of the sound. I wanted to warn him, but then a huge, hairy creature leapt out of hiding and instantly attacked the sailor, killing him on the spot. Gunshots rang out as we opened fire on the monster. With incredible agility, it dodged bullets, attacking another crew member. Only after several volleys did we manage to wound the creature, which with a piercing howl rushed towards the exit. The sailors chased after it, while I stayed to administer first aid. One sailor was dead, but the life of the other could still be saved. I quickly bandaged his wounds, and soon the sailors returned. The monster had vanished. We stood, shaken by what had happened. The creature that attacked us resembled none of the known creatures. It resembled a humanoid wolf or some kind of chimera. To my horror, I recognized Storm in this monster. What unknown forces could have turned him into such a creature? The captain decided to leave the body of the deceased sailor behind, 
and carefully load the wounded one onto a stretcher. Seizing the remaining crates of gold, we headed back to our ship, filled with a mixture of fear, horror, and bewilderment at what we had just experienced. Suddenly a blizzard broke out on the way. The snowstorm began with such force that the way back was quickly covered, and soon we lost our bearings, straying off course. Surrounded by the whirl of snow, we continued moving forward, hoping to find our way back to the ship. It was at that moment when our burden became unbearable and fear gripped our hearts with a cold hand that a creature burst out of the whirlwind like a ghost. With inhuman speed, it attacked us, carrying one of the soldiers into the abyss of the storm, leaving behind only a crate of gold, which spilled its shiny contents onto the pristine snow. Panic instantly seized us. Gunfire erupted, but the bullets disappeared into the snowy void, failing to hit their mark. Deciding to continue our journey, we were forced to abandon several crates of gold so that a few soldiers could guard us. It was a heavy but necessary decision, as each of us sought to survive in these incredibly harsh conditions. Soon we noticed an icy cliff ahead, towering majestically amidst the blizzard. Deciding that it was our chance for salvation, we headed towards it and found shelter behind its rugged walls. Here, in relative protection from the raging elements, we were able to catch our breath for a moment, trying to gather our strength and consider our next steps. When the storm and the snowy veil finally subsided, we cautiously emerged from our shelter and discovered that the elements had left us facing something unimaginably horrifying. Before us rose an icy cliff, within which, like in a sinister sarcophagus, was imprisoned a gigantic squid-like monster. Its frozen silhouette resembled the embodiment of fear itself, held captive in this arctic block. Fresh tracks were visible around the cliff. It seemed that the creature was on the verge of breaking free from its icy prison. Filled with horror and realization of our own vulnerability, we hurried to retreat. However, before we could step back, the air was pierced by a piercing howl. Looking up, we saw at the top of the cliff a humanoid wolf standing on its hind legs and emitting its terrifying cry into the sky. This vision was so shocking that forgetting about the gold, we succumbed to the instinct of survival and fled, exhausted but determined to escape at any cost. The return to the Resolute was filled with anxiety and despair. Carrying the wounded on our shoulders, we barely approached the ship when Professor Hale came running towards us. Horror was reflected on his face, and his gaze was full of concern. We hurried to share our experiences, telling him about the encounter with the monster and the loss of our comrade. But the Professor interrupted us, delivering even more alarming news. Five more crew members had disappeared. This discovery pierced us with icy cold, intensifying our determination to leave this cursed place as soon as possible. Fortunately, the work to free the ship from its icy prison was nearing completion, and we had hope for a speedy departure. After laying the wounded in the sick bay and providing necessary assistance, I immediately joined those who were chopping ice aiming to expedite our liberation. But then, from afar, a howl reached us, and soon we were surrounded by fog, as if it heralded new misfortunes. We redoubled our efforts, and finally, the Resolute managed to set sail. The sound of the departure signal made us rush onto the ship. At the last moment, glancing back at the fog, I saw that creature, standing amidst a multitude of figures. Among them were recently missing sailors and figures dressed in outdated maritime costumes, apparently victims of years past. The ship slowly moved away from the icy expanse, the ice cracking under its weight, the fog beginning to dissipate, and we finally left that place, full of mysteries and horrors behind. As we distanced ourselves from the shores shrouded in mystique and death, 
we realized that we were not returning home intact. Part of our crew was lost and part was injured. Ahead of us awaited not only the familiar harbor, but also the necessity to explain the incredible events we had experienced. Doubts about whether we would be believed for facing the impossible head on. We could barely believe in the reality of what we had gone through ourselves, clouded our thoughts on the way home. The alarm interrupted my sleep. Stretching out my hand, I found and pressed the button and the persistent sound stopped. The clock showed 8 a.m. I allowed myself to lie in bed a little longer, slowly waking up from sleep before I struggled to get out of bed. I went to the bathroom, freshened up with water, and then headed to the kitchen to prepare breakfast. Turning on the TV, I chose a channel with morning news, which now served as a background to my morning ritual. On the screen, a beautiful presenter was reviewing the latest news. First. She briefly touched on the activities of the city's mayor, but it did not catch my attention. So I only glanced at the change of topic. The next report was more interesting. Researchers from the Meteorological Center discovered an unusual temperature anomaly in Antarctica. They suggested it might be volcanic activity, but they were not completely sure. The U.S. government, in collaboration with the military, plans to send an exploratory mission to find out the reasons behind this. The presenter smiled, emphasizing that the mystery might soon be unveiled, which could particularly interest fans of Lovecraft's works. Hearing the news, I could not hide my surprise. It had not even been a week since we discovered the anomaly by studying temperature maps of Antarctica using satellite data. Our report sent to the government sparked lively interest, and it was decided to organize a research mission, of which I was to be a part. Yesterday, I received an email indicating the meeting place with the mission team, scheduled for today. Reflecting on what was to come, I finished my breakfast quickly dressed and, looking at the clock, realized that I needed to hurry. Gathering the necessary items, I headed to the address indicated in the email. Leaving the house, I headed to the nearest subway station where I easily found the right train, which was overcrowded. After making my way to the station near the government office, I exited the subway and started ascending the stairs outside. At that moment, a woman appeared before me unexpectedly. Her appearance and attire evoked thoughts of a gypsy, dark hair tied up in a voluminous bun, and her clothing bright and colorful, adorned with many patterns and fringes, clearly stood out against the gray city hustle. Looking at me with her piercing large eyes, she offered to reveal my future. Attempting to pass by was unsuccessful. She effectively blocked my way. Knowing how these situations usually go, I took out my wallet and handed her a $20 bill, hoping for a quick resolution. However, grabbing the money, the woman insisted, stating she never takes money without reason and simply asked me to extend my hand. To end this encounter as quickly as possible, I relented and offered her my palm. She carefully examined it and then, with a mysterious and cautioning tone, warned that I faced great danger like never before. If I could overcome it, I would live to a ripe old age. The woman's words did not resonate in my heart as I did not value such predictions. Thanking her for the advice, I hurried on, inwardly resenting the wasted time. Finally, I arrived at my destination, a building that hardly differed from the typical office structures of the city. It was a four-story construction with a modern facade where glass and metal harmoniously combined, creating an image of strictness and functionality. At the entrance, I was met by a security guard who, as expected, asked for my documents and explained the purpose of my visit. After a brief explanation that I was a participant in the research mission, 
I was immediately let inside and directed to the elevators, pointing out the necessary floor and office number. Approaching the elevator, I met a woman who was also about to go upstairs. She was of average height with long golden hair neatly tied back in a ponytail. She wore practical yet stylish clothes. Curiosity and openness to new acquaintances shone in her bright blue eyes. We exchanged glances and entered the elevator together, then exited on the fourth floor. To both of our surprises, we needed the same office, number 45. After a brief exchange of surprised looks, we knocked and entered the room. Inside, a small conference room awaited us, with a large table in the middle. Other people were already present. Among them stood out a man in an elegant suit, who approached us with a confident stride and greeted us. He introduced himself as Jeremy Smith, the head of the research mission appointed by the government. After a brief welcome, Jeremy invited everyone to take a seat, taking his place at the head of the table. He began with introductions. First was introduced David Gray, a middle-aged man with a serious and focused look. His appearance exuded strictness and experience, hair starting to gray and insightful eyes. David, a geophysicist by profession, was tasked with analyzing Earth's physical processes in Antarctica. His knowledge and experience were crucial for researching anomalies affecting geological stability and the magnetic field of the region which could provide the key to understanding the phenomena discovered. Then, the attention of those gathered turned to Michael Harding, the captain of a military unit. His decisive look and physical readiness were immediately noticeable. As a military commander, Michael and his squad of soldiers were responsible for the expedition's safety and logistics in Antarctic conditions. Next was introduced the woman I had met at the elevator, a glaciologist. She specialized in studying glaciers and ice sheets, and her work's importance for the mission was undeniable. Her expert analysis of the glacier's conditions, their movements, and their impact on climate change helped understand the dynamics of anomalies in Antarctica. Finally, Jeremy Smith introduced me a climatologist who discovered the anomaly. My name is Alexander Hill. My role was to analyze the climatic conditions of Antarctica, study the impact of anomalies on the global climate, and identify potential consequences for the region's ecosystem. After the introductions, Jeremy continued with the meeting's introductory part. He emphasized the mission's main task, clarifying that the temperature anomaly discovered last week initially suggested the possibility of a volcanic eruption. However, some signs did not match the typical manifestations of volcanic activity, indicating the possibility of other causes for the anomaly. That's why it was decided to send our team for a detailed investigation. Jeremy stressed that Antarctica is a harsh place, requiring serious preparation and the ability to overcome difficulties. He announced that the departure was scheduled for tomorrow, giving each of us time to finalize personal matters and prepare for the expedition. Then, the mission leader inquired about the specialized equipment and personal items we would need for work and life in Antarctica. Over the next hour, we discussed the technical aspects and logistics of the upcoming mission, clarifying the list of necessary equipment, from communication devices to scientific instruments and safety equipment. After discussing all details and questions, we said our goodbyes and dispersed, each engrossed in thoughts about the upcoming journey to be undertaken in the unexplored conditions of one of the planet's most mysterious and unpredictable corners. Dawn was already enveloping the city with its first rays when I, having checked for all necessary items, called a taxi and headed to headquarters. Our research group was already gathering there. After exchanging greetings and the latest news, we soon saw a bus approach the headquarters, 
designated to take us to the airfield. There, a captain and a squad of soldiers, ready to accompany us on this challenging journey, greeted us. In total, there were 20 of us. Upon arriving at the airfield, we found ourselves in front of a mighty Boeing C-17 Globemaster Thru, already waiting for us, loaded with special equipment. Among other cargo on board the plane were two Haglund's BV-206 all-terrain vehicles. These machines were to ensure our movement across the boundless expanses of Antarctica. The plane's interior was spacious with high ceilings and metallic walls, where foldable seats for the team were securely fastened. Each of us took our place, buckled up, and began preparing for takeoff. Despite its impressive payload capacity and size, the C-17 took off smoothly and confidently, lifting us higher into the sky. Landscapes changed behind the windows, from earthly scenes to endless clouds. After several hours of flight, our plane began to gently descend, approaching the ground. Below lay the magnificent landscape of Chile, a country with a rich history and stunning nature. The plane touched down on the runway of the airfield where a team awaited us for refueling. All processes were streamlined and well-organized to minimize downtime. As soon as the plane stopped, fuel trucks immediately approached. While refueling was underway, part of the team decided to step out to stretch their legs and breathe fresh air. The sky was clear, and the air was refreshing. A pleasant break after long hours in the enclosed space of the plane. Shortly after, when the fuel tanks were fully replenished, we returned on board. The team settled in, gearing up for the second part of the flight, the most significant and exciting. The plane, having gained the necessary altitude, headed towards the cold expanses of Antarctica. With each passing hour, it grew colder and whiter outside the windows. Glaciers and snow-covered peaks began to emerge more distinctly, and the sea took on a deep blue hue dotted here and there with icebergs. During the flight, as the icy expanses of Antarctica began to flash by the windows, Emilia, the Antarctica specialist, enthusiastically shared her knowledge with us. She told us that the ice sheet covers 98% of the continent, with some ice reaching heights of 13,000 feet. Her stories came to life with the views of the first icebergs appearing on the horizon. Hearing about the height of the ice, I couldn't help but marvel at the scale and beauty of this place. As we approached McMurdo Station, located on the shore of Ross Island in the Ross Sea, Emilia continued to share interesting facts. She mentioned that due to the height of the ice sheets, airplanes are forced to fly 10,000 feet higher than usual to avoid colliding with icebergs. Antarctic snow, she said, is different from Arctic snow. It is drier and harder, which can pose a danger to airplane tires during landing. The plane began its descent and soon made a landing, a bit of a jolt, but not too severe. When the plane finally stopped and we began to disembark, the first thing that struck me was the deafening silence enveloping the icy expanses and the cold that pierced to the bones. Before us stood McMurdo Station, the largest American research base in Antarctica. It looked like a small town submerged in snow, with numerous buildings interconnected by paths already covered in snow. Some of the buildings were coated in frost, giving them a magical appearance. In the distance, the runway was visible, already being prepared for the next flight, while mountains and glaciers stretched around the perimeter of the station, creating a unique and captivating scene. Looking around and inhaling the cool, fresh air, the three of us stood absorbed by the beauty of the boundless Antarctic expanses. The weather was favorable to us. A clear sky stretched overhead, like a promise of new discoveries. David, taking out a cigarette, lit it, and exhaling smoke, said thoughtfully, 
This place is the last whisper of the earth before the silence of eternity, where fate finds its true face in the endless ice. His words made us ponder deeply, adding a special depth to the moment. Soon, the rumble of engines interrupted our contemplation. From the airplane hangar to the street, all-terrain vehicles rolled out, ready for the journey ahead. People from the station approached to help unload our gear. About an hour later, we finished loading everything necessary into the vehicles. After a roll call and a brief discussion of the route, we took our seats, ready to depart. In each all-terrain vehicle, designed for 17 people, we sat 10, leaving the rest of the space for cargo. Making ourselves comfortable, we set off. According to our calculations, the journey would take a couple of days, meaning we had to move without delay. It was mid-February, and it was important for us to complete all planned research before the end of the Antarctic summer. Crossing the vast expanse of Antarctica, our expedition slowly but surely moved forward. Around us reigned an immense whiteness, only interrupted by the occasional rocky outcrops and deep cracks in the ice which we carefully avoided or crossed. The sky above us was clear, allowing the sun to cast a soft glow on the snow, making the landscape almost mystical. From time to time, we stopped to check coordinates, look around, or make notes about the terrain and weather conditions. These pauses also gave us all a chance to breathe in the Antarctic air and momentarily feel the silence and majesty of the surrounding nature. Emilia, our glaciologist, occasionally pointed out landscape features, distant glacial formations, snow-covered peaks that stood out on the horizon, and unique snow structures formed by wind and time. She spoke about the processes underlying these phenomena, adding depth to our understanding of the environment around us. As the first day of our journey came to an end, we felt the need for a rest. Despite the constant light of the polar day, fatigue from the trip made itself known. We chose a suitable spot on a flat surface, sheltered from the wind by ice outcrops and quickly set up tents, creating a temporary camp for dinner, we pulled out thermally resistant packets of frozen food that just needed to be mixed with boiling water. Thanks to modern technology, even in such conditions, we could enjoy a variety of meals. The menu included all the necessary nutrients consisting of hot soup, a meat dish with potatoes and vegetables, as well as high energy bars and hot tea for dessert. After dinner, sharing impressions of the first day's journey and discussing plans for tomorrow, we dispersed to our tents. Attempting to sleep in the eternal light of the polar day, many of us used sleep masks or simply tied a piece of fabric around our heads. Regardless of the precautions, falling asleep in such an unusual place was not easy, but fatigue from the long day eventually took over and each of us gradually drifted into sleep, dreaming of what the next day would bring in this mysterious corner of the world. I woke up a couple of hours later. Lying in the tent for a bit, I decided to go outside. Dressed up, I felt the cool air hit my face. Noticing that David was also awake and sitting at the edge of the camp smoking a cigarette, I approached to keep him company. He looked at me but said nothing, so we sat in silence, watching the snowy plains. Suddenly he broke the silence and said, For some reason, I have a bad feeling. Flicking his cigarette, he continued, I served in Afghanistan, it was a real hell. There I developed a sort of intuition that saved me more than once. It might sound implausible, but I believe in it. Then he looked at me, gauging my reaction. I just nodded. I wasn't one to judge someone's beliefs. I asked him, What do you think could be the danger waiting for us? Danger, he pondered. In principle, we're well prepared, and we can survive a storm or other natural disasters, so I don't even know, but this is a wild place and anything can be expected here. 
Suddenly David froze and stood up, noticing something in the distance. Turning in the direction of his gaze, I saw a small dark gray dot rapidly approaching us. What's that? I asked. Not sure yet, David replied, squinting and trying to make out what it was. The dot grew larger, and we could somewhat discern what it was. At first it seemed to be a bear, but the creature had a strange limping gait. It was also clear that this creature was of enormous size and was rapidly approaching us. David reacted instantly, raising the alarm. His shout woke the entire camp, and the soldiers immediately rushed out of their tents. Captain Harding ran up to us with a frightened look and asked what happened. We pointed to the approaching creature, after which he rushed into a tent and returned with a rifle and a shotgun. The captain ordered the soldiers to take positions, aiming numerous weapons at the target. David and I stepped back and waited for what would happen next. When the creature got close enough to be seen in detail, it turned out to be a sea lion looking unusual, almost mutant-like, and moving with a strange gallop. The captain ordered everyone to get ready, then stepped forward and started shouting, trying to scare the animal away. However, it did not react and continued running towards us. Then the captain ordered to open fire. Numerous shots were fired, and many bullets hit the creature, causing sprays of blood, but it kept running. Everyone was scared, and the soldiers didn't stop shooting. The captain put down the rifle and took a large shotgun that was lying nearby. Then, aiming at almost point-blank range when the animal almost reached him, he fired. The creature collapsed at his feet from the shot. Everyone froze, trying to comprehend what had happened. David was the first to approach the animal's carcass. Soon, we all surrounded it, trying to figure out what we had encountered. Before us lay a sea lion, but its appearance was far from normal. The creature seemed mutant. Its skin was covered in strange markings and scars, as well as scabs, as if it was diseased. The animal's eyes were unusually large and bloodshot. One of its flippers appeared distorted, which gave it a limping gait. There were areas on its body with unnaturally thickened skin, like armor protecting it from external threats. My God, what happened to it? Emily asked in shock. I'm more curious about what it's doing in the center of the continent and so far from water. David pondered thoughtfully. I glanced at the carcass and a shiver ran through me. The animal looked eerie. We stood there for a while, sharing our speculations. Then the captain ordered everyone to return to their tents and continue resting. He left a sentry and also headed to his tent. But no one could sleep. Soon, we decided to gather and continue on our journey. We left the animal's carcass lying there, only noting its coordinates to return later and take it for research. Continuing our journey, we moved forward under the constant light of the polar day. Despite the sun never setting below the horizon, I felt an anxiety that did not leave me after the encounter with the unusual creature. Approaching our designated location, something unusual happened. Our electronics started to malfunction, and communication was completely disrupted. The navigation system stopped working, indicating a malfunction in orientation. At that moment, we stopped and got out of the all-terrain vehicles to figure out what was happening. Mr. Smith, the head of our mission, turned to the captain with a question. Cap, what's happening? The captain, trying to catch a signal with his satellite phone, replied, the satellite communication unexpectedly cut off, and the navigator stopped working. Something here is causing interference. He continued to walk around, making circles in an attempt to restore the connection. At the captain's suggestion, we decided to move back a bit to check if the communication would return. Mr. Smith agreed with this plan, and we quickly took our seats, heading back along the tracks of our wheels. It only took a few minutes before the captain ordered us to stop. 
the communication was restored. Getting out of the vehicles, we gathered around the navigator again. David suggested the presence of a magnetic field ahead, which could disrupt our devices. Based on this hypothesis, we roughly determined the direction and distance to our goal. Only a couple of miles left. When we finally reached the place, only an endless snowy plain surrounded us, intersected by a single snow mound. Mr. Smith, surveying the area, ordered to set up camp right there. We were to conduct research in this mysterious zone and try to figure out the cause of the malfunctions with our equipment. While the soldiers were setting up the tents, we, the team of researchers, decided to explore the surroundings. Walking around, we found nothing unusual or indicative of the cause of the disruptions in our electronics, which only added to our questions. According to meteorological data, the ice in this area really should not have been preserved even at such thickness. This observation only intensified our perplexity. Soon we began deploying scientific equipment all around our camp. First, we set up a portable meteorological station to monitor real-time weather changes, including temperature, humidity, pressure, and wind speed. This allowed us to compare the local climatic conditions with the standard data. Then, using deep thermometers and a drill, we started studying the ice temperature at different levels, aiming to understand whether it matched its surface temperature and the surrounding air. With ground-penetrating radars, we began scanning the subsurface layers, hoping to detect unusual structures or changes beneath the ice cover that could explain what was happening. By the end of the day, we had a meeting, and I saw puzzled faces around me. It turned out that the readings from all devices were within normal limits, and nothing unusual was found in this place. Although satellite communication still did not work, this led us to a dead end. After a brief discussion, we decided to rest and continue the research tomorrow. After dinner, we, very tired, went to sleep. I was awakened by deep, resonating thuds that seemed to come from the very depths of the earth. Looking around, I saw that not just I, but my companions were also awakened by these unusual sounds. We quickly dressed and exited the tents. The entire camp was on its feet, and anxiety was evident on the faces of all present. Mr. Smith, approaching us, asked with noticeable concern in his voice, What is that sound? We just shook our heads in bewilderment. Something was happening in the depths of the earth. But what exactly? David decided to check personally. He laid a sleeping mat on the ground and pressed his ear against the surface. It doesn't seem like volcanic activity, the sound is too uniform. It's more reminiscent of a heartbeat, he said, making us all exchange puzzled looks. What was hidden in the depths of the Antarctic ice? Emilia added her observations. By my calculations, the depth of the ice here is about 10,000 feet. The sound is deep and muffled, meaning it's coming from the very bottom. The discussion didn't lead us to a definite answer, and Mr. Smith suggested that everyone go to sleep considering we hadn't slept properly for two days already. As we dispersed to our tents, I tried to fall asleep, but the sound continued to bother me. It seemed to resonate with my body, causing anxiety. Unable to fall asleep, I decided to go outside. There was only one soldier on guard, a precaution after the previous incident. I checked the meteorological station, but found nothing abnormal. Sitting on a portable chair, I began to gaze at the snowy plain. In the distance, a hill was outlined suspiciously unnatural. Armed with a shovel, I headed towards this hill and started digging. The top layer of snow gave way easily, but then came the ice, slowing down my efforts. At some point, I noticed something dark shining through the ice. We were on a plane. 
there shouldn't be any mountains here. Continuing to dig, I soon discovered a roof made of dark, sturdy metal which looked out of place against the background of ice. I was amazed by my discovery. As I examined the find, a voice came from behind me. What are you doing here? Looking back, I saw the captain, who was looking at the pit I had dug with curiosity. Climbing out of it, I noticed other members of the group approaching. When everyone gathered, I told them about what had happened. Everyone nodded in surprise, and upon learning about my find, they froze in shock, then rushed to see it. Armed with shovels, we started clearing the snow, and after about an hour of work, a small structure appeared in front of us resembling a house without windows, with only one massive iron door. We tried to open it, but it was locked. Then one of the soldiers brought a drill and started drilling the lock. Suddenly, he jumped back in fright, dropping the drill. The captain shouted at him, asking what had happened, but he pointed at the door, saying he heard a noise from inside. We all became alarmed. I approached the door and pressed my ear against it. At first it was quiet, but then I heard some rustling, unable to determine exactly what it was. I confirmed that there was something behind the door. The captain, grabbing the drill, said, We won't know until we open the door, and continued drilling. Finally, the lock gave way, and he, grabbing the handle, looked back at us. We froze in anticipation. The soldiers prepared their weapons. The captain quietly and carefully pulled the door towards him, which began to open with a creak and a groan. We tensed up, but looking inside, we found that there was no one there, only a small room with an elevator shaft in its center. We cautiously entered, peering into the shaft, which descended into the depths of the earth to an unknown depth. Next to the shaft, I noticed a lever, which Mr. Smith approached, and, without hesitation, activated. A deep rumble emanated from the depths to our surprise. The elevator turned out to be operational. Soon, the elevator cabin rose to us. The elevator was spacious, designed to carry about 10 people. Its interior was minimalist. Metal walls, a small control panel with buttons and emergency lighting creating a gloomy atmosphere. After a short discussion, we decided that some of us would descend for exploration while some soldiers would stay on the surface to guard the camp. We stepped into the elevator, Mr. Smith pressed the descent button, and the cabin began to slowly descend. With each meter, the light from the upper hatch diminished until it disappeared completely, leaving us in the dim light of emergency lighting. The descent was smooth, but filled with tension. Each of us understood that we were descending into the unknown which could hold anything. The descent lasted quite a long time, and finally the elevator stopped. Darkness surrounded us. Turning on flashlights, we stepped out of the elevator. My first concerned question was about the presence of ventilation at such a depth as air clearly couldn't penetrate here naturally. However, the local ventilation shafts seemed to be working properly. The air here was surprisingly clean, albeit slightly stale. We found ourselves in a corridor. The walls were metallic and covered with a layer of rust indicating long neglect. Drops of condensation hung from the metal due to the humidity of the air. Walking down the corridor, we entered a large room which apparently served as a laboratory. The laboratory was filled with various research apparatus and equipment, which looked outdated but once probably represented cutting-edge technology. Posters with fascist symbols hung on the walls, and papers written in German were scattered on the tables and floor. This suggested that the facility belonged to the authorities of Nazi Germany meaning that this place was almost a hundred years old. The laboratory looked ravaged. Overturned furniture, broken glass equipment, and documents scattered everywhere. 
In one of the corners, we discovered the skeleton of a soldier of the Third Reich. He was leaning against the wall, as if his owner had died waiting for help or in a last desperate attempt to find shelter. This grim find added heavy notes to the atmosphere of our exploration. As we inspected the laboratory, we tried to mentally reconstruct what had happened here many years ago. The papers on the tables possibly contained reports on experiments conducted here. And Mr. Smith, picking up one of them, asked if anyone knew German. Only David responded. He took the paper and, shining a flashlight on it, tried to read the contents. Soon he said that it described a report on the condition of the subject, and he suggested that experiments on humans might have been conducted here. We continued our exploration, and then Emily said she found a power lever and asked if she could pull it. After a brief hesitation, we agreed. With a slight tension in the air and a click of the lever, suddenly lights turned on throughout the station and the ventilation system started making sounds of operation. I was amazed that after so many years of neglect, the systems here were still functioning. Thanks to the illumination, we could now examine everything carefully. Walking along the tables, I found a folder. Opening it, I saw a mystical symbol in the form of a diamond with a wolf's paw depicted in the center. Calling David over, I asked him to translate what was written. He read aloud the following. The stone negatively affects the body, causing changes within it. Prolonged exposure to its radiation can lead to irreversible transformation, resulting in the subject losing its human appearance, but gaining unprecedented physical strength. Unfortunately, the creature also loses control over itself, making its use on the battlefield problematic. The possibility of deploying it behind enemy lines exists, but is associated with great risks. At the moment, I consider the use of this method impractical. I recommend continuing research, as this object has unlimited potential due to its otherworldly origin. The document also contained various reports and figures, but the main content was truly shocking. What could the Nazis have been developing in this laboratory, and what did they discover here? We summoned Mr. Smith and showed him the document. As he studied it suddenly from above us, from the ceiling, we heard a noise. We all instantly raised our heads, and the soldiers grabbed their weapons. Someone is moving through the shaft, the captain speculated. However, David, with a tone hinting at darker thoughts, added, Perhaps not someone, but something. This thought made all of us tense from the uncertainty of what could be lurking at such depth, deep in the heart of Antarctica. Without wasting time, Mr. Smith suggested continuing our exploration. We headed to the door at the end of the laboratory, which led us to another elevator shaft. Pausing before it, we began discussing whether we should continue our descent. After a short discussion, it was decided that part of our group would stay here on this level, while the rest would continue descending. Two soldiers were to remain upstairs. They handed us their pistols while keeping their rifles. Pulling the lever again, Mr. Smith called the elevator. After a while, the cabin ascended, and we stepped inside, preparing to continue our journey into the uncharted depths. Tension filled the elevator as each of us was immersed in thoughts about what might await us next. This time, the descent into the depths of the earth took much longer than the first. Once again, we heard the same sound that had been haunting us. And with each foot, we descended. The sound of knocking grew louder and clearer, as if calling us to it. When the elevator doors opened, our eyes were drawn to a huge cavern. The floor was earthen, while the ceiling and walls were made of pure ice. Icicle stalactites hung from the ceiling, creating the impression of a frozen underground palace. Lanterns hung from the ceiling, illuminating the space and making it eerily beautiful. We stood in shock at this sight, but soon our attention was drawn to one thing. 
In the center of the cavern, drawing attention with its unusual appearance, floated a cube the size of a truck. It seemed incredible. Floating in the air, slowly descending and rising as if it were set on an invisible cushion of air. Various wires and devices were scattered around the cube, creating the impression that the cube was part of some larger experiment. However, the real discovery was six transparent capsules filled with red transparent liquid, evenly spaced around the cube. Inside these capsules, floating in the liquid, were creatures resembling humans, but partially covered in fur. Their faces were grotesque and elongated, making them look like wolves. The creature's eyes were closed, as if they were in a deep sleep. In rhythm with the pulsation of the cube, they moved slowly up and down in the liquid. We didn't know how to react to this discovery. I looked at my companions. Emily covered her mouth with her hand while David whistled and cursed. What the hell is this? I, too, stood in some kind of trance. It was the moment when your previous world collapses and a new, not better, but terrible one takes its place. I rubbed my eyes and decided to continue inspecting. Approaching the cube, I was able to examine it more closely. It was covered with mysterious symbols executed in a style unlike anything earthly. The symbols shimmered with red light, creating a network of veins. It also emitted the same sound we had heard earlier. With each beat, the veins began to glow brighter, creating the illusion of a beating heart. Suddenly, from behind me, I heard the captain's voice announcing the discovery of a journal. We immediately gathered around it to learn more. The entries in the journal were in German, and David took on the task of translating. It turned out that the cube was discovered in the 1930s, and after that, Hitler sent his scientists to study this object. I remembered reading about how Hitler was obsessed with the supernatural, but I didn't think it would turn out to be true. The journal also contained symbols similar to those on the cube. Many pages were filled with them, and at the end of the entries, there was a combination of six symbols. What happened next and the fate of the scientists remained a mystery. Emily took the journal and carefully studying it approached the cube. She began touching the symbols in the order specified on the last pages of the journal. I noticed this too late, and a sinister premonition came over me. I wanted to warn her to stop, but I didn't have time. As soon as Emily touched the last symbol which lit up brightly, the cube began to slowly rotate around its axis, gradually speeding up, emitting sounds resembling a speeding heartbeat, and its veins glowed brightly. We recoiled in horror. The captain noticed huge devices resembling cabinets nearby and called for everyone to take cover behind them. We all hurried there. We didn't know what to expect from this unexpected turn of events. The cube continued to rotate and glow until suddenly there was a small light explosion. We closed our eyes and when we looked again, we saw something before us. A portal formed in front of the cube, emitting red light and covered in beautiful ripples, and the atmosphere in the cavern became tense to the breaking point. The situation intensified when I noticed that the eyes of the creatures in the capsule suddenly opened. It happened so suddenly and filled me with intense fear. I quietly informed my companions about this. We all watched in horror as the capsule's contents began to move, and the capsules, like spider webs, cracked. The German soldiers who emerged from the portal also noticed this and seemed to start getting nervous. They aimed their weapons at the capsules and suddenly began shooting. The sound of gunfire and roaring filled the cavern, creating chaos. The creatures in the capsules rushed at the soldiers, tearing them apart. Heart-wrenching screams echoed around us. We watched in shock as the captain, gesturing to snap us out of our stupor, ordered us to head for the exit. 
We, crouching and trying not to attract attention, slowly moved along the wall toward the elevator shaft. Almost reaching it, I heard a strange sound coming from there. Suddenly, a creature appeared before us, a huge wolf, more like a mutant. It was different from those in the capsules, but bore some resemblance to them. The creature snarled viciously at us, preparing to pounce. The captain reacted instantly and fired his gun. The creature dodged, although a couple of bullets hit it, but to our horror it seemed unaffected. It blocked our path to the elevator and lunged at the captain. We opened fire, which fortunately saved him. The creature merely backed off. We helped the captain up and, fending off the creatures, made our way back to our previous hiding spot. Looking back at the battlefield with the Nazis, I noticed with horror that they had been completely wiped out and the creatures stood over their bodies, devouring their flesh. My companions also saw this, and despair washed over us. Hiding behind the devices, we pondered our next move. On one side, the creature by the elevator was attacking us, and on the other, the creatures were feasting on the Nazis' flesh. At that moment, we realized we were caught between two fronts, and a decision needed to be made about our next actions. In this critical moment, adrenaline surged through my body, and I had a single idea. I told everyone to follow me, asking Emily for the journal. Everyone looked at me puzzled, trying to understand what I was planning. I headed toward the cube, quietly creeping along the wall. Glancing back, I saw the others following me. The creatures continued to devour the soldiers, and the massive wolf-like creature stood at the exit, as if its task was to guard it. I approached the cube, which had already stopped and the portal had disappeared. I began entering the same combination that Emily had entered before. When the last symbol lit up, the cube started spinning, attracting the attention of the creatures. I prayed silently for the portal to open faster. We huddled around the cube and suddenly there was a flash. When we opened our eyes, a red portal lay before us. I didn't know what awaited us next, but it was the only way out of the situation. We were trapped thousands of feet below the surface. The creatures slowly moved toward us. I yelled for everyone to jump into the portal. First, with the words, screw you all, David jumped. The others followed suit, disappearing into the portal. Only the captain and I remained, and he opened fire on the creatures, shouting for me to jump. I saw that bullets had no effect on these creatures, and... Abandoning the journal, I grabbed the captain's jacket and pulled him toward the portal. A flash of light and... Literally a moment after passing through the portal, I found myself in the same cavern next to my companions. Instantly, I feared that we hadn't escaped and that the creatures would devour us. But looking around, I realized the situation was different. The cavern was brightly lit, and people in uniforms approached us, among them soldiers with U.S. flag patches. I breathed a sigh of relief, understanding that they were our people. Soon, a man in a lab coat approached us, extremely surprised to see us. He introduced himself and told us what had happened. His words shocked us. It turns out that when we jumped into the portal, the soldiers remaining above ground tried to follow us but found only two who had stayed in the first laboratory. To their horror, the second elevator wasn't working. Returning to the station and reporting the incident, all forces were mobilized. Restoring the elevator took a long time, and everyone understood that our chances of survival were minimal. After the elevator was restored, creatures were discovered, and the battle with them dragged on for years. Eventually, when the creatures were destroyed, scientists were able to study the cube, found the journal, and, using the combination from it, we appeared from the portal. Listening to this story, we were in shock. David asked how many years had passed since our disappearance. The professor sadly replied, Five years. 
We froze in place, realizing we had been missing for a whole five years. The captain, however, said, But at least we're alive, right? We nodded in agreement. The professor suggested that we go to the surface to be examined by medics. On the way, I asked the professor about the wolf-like creature describing its appearance. He shook his head in confusion. We exchanged worried glances. And at that moment, as we approached the elevator shaft, there was a rustling from above. We all froze and looked up, awaiting the unknown.